to meet out favor and grace from that treasury of Christ's works and the works of all the saints to forgive and to pardon men and women on earth. That was the issue in particular. That was what Luther was being asked to recant. Will you recant your stance on this? And will you fall in line with the teaching of the Pope and various church councils over time? But Luther, to his credit, brings it to the larger issue. That's just one issue. The larger matter is this. What do we stand on? What formulates our faith and practice? And you are telling me that councils of men and men who preside over churches, they have the ability and the right to tell me what is true and what has come from God. And Luther's point was, I can only rely on Scripture. The plea, one of the pleas of the Reformers would become to us in the Latin, sola scriptura. Scripture alone. Our appeal for our faith and practice is Scripture alone. However, you don't have to read much church history to understand that, well, that plea, while it is a noble plea and a noble ideal, that even the Reformers themselves did not remain true, wholly true to that plea uh, throughout their time. All of them had an infatuation with Augustine, and Augustine had an interesting way of approaching Scripture, and they viewed some of his teachings, while not necessarily scriptural, but he's close enough to the apostles' time that, well, they viewed them as being authoritative from God as well. And of course, they would then formulate their own creeds and their own councils and their own church structures, which would then give to their followers, here is the truth of God. In the late 1700s and the early 1800s, in our country and other countries around the world, Independently, there were groups that began to challenge these ideas as well. That to be a Christian, you must not only read and follow the Bible, but you must know the teaching and the creed of this particular church. One such group simply called themselves the Christian Church, and they came up with a document, the five cardinal principles of the Christian Church. The third principle of the Christian church was this, the Holy Bible, and this is from 1794. The Holy Bible, or the Scriptures of the Old and New Testament, are our only creed and a sufficient rule of faith and practice. It's the same point that Luther was making. We must and must only follow the Bible, the Word of God. Barton W. Stone is the one who's probably best known to, to some in the audience here. But he and several others formed what was known as the Springfield Presbytery. And they formed that because their teaching, what they read in Scripture, did not line up with the Presbyterian church that they had formerly been a part of. So they formed their own presbytery. But then they realized, why are we doing this? Why are we trying to formulate this, this group that we're trying to give, here's what you need to teach and you need to practice when... We really just need to follow what Scripture says. So they made a last will and testament of their presbytery. And one of the articles of their last will and testament was, We will that the people henceforth take the Bible as the only sure guide to heaven. And as many as are offended with other books which stand in competition with it may cast them into the fire if they choose, for it is better to enter into life having one book than having many to be cast into hell. And if nothing else, you got to appreciate that turn of a phrase right there. But that principle, we want to follow and follow only the Bible. And again, independent of them, another man, another group even, that began to leave the denominations and their creeds and various councils. A man by the name of Thomas Campbell in 1808 said this, became somewhat of a mantra of what we refer to as the Restoration Movement, where the Bible speaks... We speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. That principle, again, you find people, conscientious people throughout history, trying to follow. We want to be guided by the Word of God and the Word of God only. It is a principle of the utmost importance. But we've got to be honest. 
It is a principle that we can grapple with in our lives as well because there are so many things that are trying to compete in our affections and in our faith and practice to establish them on something other than the Bible. So what we want to talk about today is just this notion of being biblical, what that means and the challenges to that. And we'll look at three challenges to that from Scripture, challenges that we need to be aware of. And the first is that we need to be biblical and not controlled by the whims of culture. And that is the issue, I think, when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And again, if you're still there, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And notice a passage that was not read by Brother Kyle this morning, but skip down just a little bit in verse 12. Here is the issue that Paul raises. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? To my knowledge, there was not a Christian group at this time going out there and teaching, oh no, there is no resurrection. What is the issue though? The issue for the saints in Corinth was not a particular splinter group or maybe even necessarily a particular teacher. No, they're having to grapple with their own culture. They're having to grapple with Greek culture in general. In fact, there was an epitaph that would not have been unknown to those, probably. A common Greek epitaph of, I was not, I was, I am not, I don't care. That was the attitude of many towards death. That there was a time when I did not exist. I exist now. There's a time in which I will die, my body will seek to exist, and I won't care. They may have thought the soul lived on, but to think that the body would live on, that would be something ridiculous to many who would listen to the gospel. We understand that from Acts chapter 17, as Paul proclaimed the gospel in Athens, as he spoke about the resurrection of Christ, there were many who scoffed at him on that day. What they are being affected by is culture. And guess what? It's not the only time the saints in Corinth were affected by their culture. Go back to chapter 1. Notice the first issue that Paul raises with them. Chapter 1 and verse 12. As he's talked about, he had heard that there were divisions among them. And they say in verse 12, What I mean is that each one of you says... I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And then he goes on to say, is Christ divided? Were were any of us, were, were Cephas, or Apollos, or myself, were we crucified for you? No, there should be no division here. Well, what's the issue? The city culture of Corinth. That you would have all these teachers come in, and they would come in and they would espouse their doctrines and they'd gather a following and you could say to others, well, I listen to this teacher and I'm of this school. What school are you of? Let's debate the points and the principles. And now they're doing that with Christianity. Well, yeah, we're all Christian, but I really like the way Peter does this. Or I really like the way Paul put this or Apollos put this. So, I'm of their school and their way of thinking, and so we can, we can talk about the difference. No! Don't be influenced by your culture that way. Go right back to the Bible. Go to the principles of Scripture. You could go to the sixth chapter, and as Paul rebukes them for their immorality, they're, even, uh, they're engaging in fornication with prostitutes. Again, that's, that's all cultural. That was a cultural norm in Corinth. So what is the appeal? Well, this is what our brother read for us earlier this morning. And just begin again in chapter 15 and verse 1. As Paul is is beginning to address this matter, and he says in verse 1, I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
What I've told you has come straight from God. It is Scripture. It's not part of a, of a combined Bible at this time, but that's what we would say. It is biblical. And Paul says, let's go back to that. Let, let's get away from the, the culture and the influence of culture, and let's just go straight back to what God has revealed. And I think it's an interesting thing here, too. To be biblical does not mean find the command. Because that's not what Paul does here. Being biblical is not just finding the statement in Scripture where God says, do this or don't do this. Now, there are statements of Scripture. There there are the words of Jesus Himself. For instance, in John 5, 28 and 29, where Jesus foretold that all who are in the grave were going to rise up. Paul could have appealed to that, but he didn't. He appeals to a principle. You go further in the text, he appeals to the principle, well, Christ was raised. We know He is raised because here are all the witnesses that saw Him. And this is, of course, in accordance with everything that God had prophesied was going to happen. But Paul's point is, if Christ rose, of course you're going to rise too. This is the principle of it all. Don't let culture dictate your faith and your practice. That is certainly an important concept for us. And it's one that that I hope we'll return to as this year goes on. How it is that our culture can affect our faith and practice and and our need to be biblical. You take an issue. Think of dating in our society. Okay, I can't find you the chapter... Uh, in the Bible that issue that deals with dating. Okay, that one's not there. Wish it was. Be helpful, particularly as my kids get older. But it's, it's not there. But you go across the world, and, and notions of dating are different in different cultures. You could have a culture that there is no such thing as dating. Okay, there is a a prearranged uh, marriage that will happen one day, and the parents have decided that that is that culture. There are cultures where you could enter into a courtship and mom and dad and maybe even some extended family will always be there in that courtship. And so you would have an opportunity, yes, if there was a a young lady or a young man that, well, most likely in this culture, probably going to be the young man has an interest in you. Well, a courtship could ensue, and the family is involved in this, and they're going to help you make that decision if this is Mr. Right or not. I don't think we would mistake American culture with any of that, would we? And most of us would say, well, dating culture in America has only devolved over time. Or now, you look at the statistics, and they're they're pretty brutal. The number of people, young men and women, that are even thinking about marriage is on a drastic decline. Now it's a norm in society, we'll just move in together. That is a norm of society. No, not an outlier, it's a norm. We'll move in together and we'll, we'll see if you know, this is a good relationship. And if it is, over time, then yeah, maybe, maybe in the future we'll look at marriage. I'm not saying that's what you're doing or where you are. I'm just saying, think of it. If we live in a culture where that is the norm, how are our attitudes shaped by that? How permissive and how easily it would be to be very permissive of inappropriate relationships between a young man and a young girl. Because, well, we live in this culture where It's just the norm. Well, what would God say we need to do? Go back to the Bible. Not because there's a chapter that says, okay, here's how how you should date. No, but the principles of what it means to be created in the image of God. What it means to respect God. What it means to respect God's creation. Those who are made in His likeness, male and female. What holiness is about. All these things, we would say, okay, we need to be biblical. Think about, again, how our world has normalized any number of sins. 
Think about how our normalized uh, society has normalized homosexuality. It's, it's a norm now. It's not an outlier, it's a norm. Well, we need to be biblical in our attitude there, toward that. We need to be biblical in all ways. Yes, we would, we would need to be biblical in saying, no, it is still sinful in the eyes of God. And we would also need to be biblical in saying that there are men and women who struggle and God's grace is for them. We need to be biblical in all things. Not just subject to the whims of culture. There's so many different things we could talk about. And Lord willing, we, we can talk about some matters as time goes on. But let's look at, at a second way in which we can be less than biblical. What if we just get fascinated by the unknown? And we kind of go off into speculation. Go over in your New Testament with me to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we could, we could read a, a decent section from 1 Timothy chapter 1, but just read a couple of verses here. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and let's start in verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. In this epistle, Paul does not define what the real issue is. He doesn't define, well, here's the false teaching that is so prevalent. It would seem that it was a false teaching of a Jewish sort. The myths are likely... Uh, embellishments of Old Testament stories that people used to, to really make some what they thought were significant theological points. Uh, the genealogies are likely, again, the, the Old Testament genealogies and, and making a lot there where there's just maybe not a lot. But there's this fascination with this. And Paul's warning is these are not outsiders. These are among you. And what they're not doing is just saying, let's find out what God says and let's follow that. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy. You be mindful of the word that I've given to you. You be mindful of this doctrine. And so throughout First and Second Timothy and Titus as well, Paul will have these exhortations. You need to teach them Scripture. You need to teach them, here is what God has said. Let's get away from speculation. Let's get away from from that which is only meant to confuse. And let's just get back to rock-solid truth. Let's be biblical. Well, there's a few ways in which we can kind of fall prey to this. There is, of course, and and, this has been going on for some time, we, we can become very fascinated with the difficult sections of Scripture. Okay? We can get into, and I don't necessarily think Revelation is really that complicated. It's a fairly straightforward point, but there are certainly some challenging texts there. And you can go back in your Old Testament and these apocryphal uh, books, and, and there's some challenging points there. You can look at Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 24 about the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. There are some challenging points there. But what I fear sometimes is, well, let's look at these things... And let's try to make sure I've got that 100% concrete and I can even start applying that to the things I'm seeing in the world around me. But I don't really know. I'm just, I'm just kind of speculating. We wind up looking like this guy sometimes. We're just, we're just trying to piece things together all over the place and, and now here's what I'm really fascinated by. And I think what God would say is, do you know the basic principles of my word? Are you following that? Get away from the confusing thing. Again, we know what Peter says about Paul's teaching, that there's some difficult things, but that's not the vast majority of Scripture. That's one way. But there's another way too. I go back to the Reformers, men like Luther, Calvin, Zwingli. The, the principle they, they fought for was a noble one, sola scriptura, okay? Scripture only. 
But what all of them wound up doing was developing what we would call a system of theology. Calvin's probably the best known to us. Calvin started with with two misguided principles, I would say. Uh, He certainly believed in the the greatness of God, the superiority of God. won't challenge that, but what he made of that, I think he was mistaken on. And he made a lot about the total depravity of man, man's complete inability to do anything good or even want to do anything good. So he starts there and makes a whole system of theology. Well, what happens when you make a system of theology? Well, that means everything in Scripture has to fit that system somehow. Well, what do you do with a a passage like 2 Peter 3, 9? You know, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is God's patience here. Well, you're going to have to do some verbal and theological and intellectual uh, jumping of hoops and finding all kinds of ways in which you can make this passage fit your system. We can be guilty of that too. And oftentimes, because we're concerned about false teachings in some areas, and how some principles of God's Word are are made to be what they're not, and so we kind of go the opposite way, and we get into speculation about, well, I know it says this, but let's just pay attention to this over here. And what are we doing? We're not being biblical anymore. When what we need to do is that if God says this, this is what we need to live by and what we need to practice. This is our faith and practice. I don't know that I developed that very well, but maybe we can fix that later. But I want to talk about this one because this one's the real important one. We need to be biblical and not captive to our tradition. I realize I've, I should have made this a two-point lesson instead of a three-point lesson now. But go to Matthew 15 with me. Matthew 15. The Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands when they eat. We'll say more about traditions. Traditions are not bad. They're not. They're not evil. Everybody has traditions. They're just things that are handed down. There are some traditions that we hold to because they're handed down by God and His apostles. We would say those are scriptural truth. They're handed down to us. But there are other traditions that, okay, God didn't command it. It's a tradition. It may be a tradition that helps us do what God said. And those are fine. They're fine so long as we don't make them binding. And that's the first thing I think you could show from this passage. The Pharisees were not wrong in washing their hands. They viewed holiness and cleanliness as, as of vast importance. Now, their application of their thinking I I may disagree with, but their mind was, we walk around Jerusalem, we walk around our cities, and you never know what you may come into contact with that's unclean. You know, you could touch something that blood had been on. Uh, you You could come into contact with somebody else who had also been in contact with something that was dead. Or maybe there's one of those Gentiles out there, and you could accidentally touch that person. You just never know what's going to defile. You never know what's going to make you unclean. And so they developed a whole system for washing their hands. There's a whole section of the Mishnah devoted to the hands and the washing of the hands and the purifying of the hands. And they have prescribed it, how much water. And the water has to be poured over the hands because only running water can purify. You can't just have you know, water in a basin. You want. No, it has to be poured over your hands. So they go to all this. And that's what their question is about here. Why aren't your disciples doing that? Tradition then has ventured into areas it should not go. Their tradition was, in their mind, helping them in their holiness, and they wanted everybody else to have the same tradition. But Jesus takes it a step further. Verse 3, 
He answered them, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. By the way, that's straight from the Ten Commandments. That's straight from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. Every Jew knew, no, we're supposed to keep the Ten Commandments. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. Mark refers to this as korban. The idea that because your vows are supposed to be made, that are made to God, are supposed to be kept, that if you vowed that whatever you were giving to your family, you were actually giving to God, you could get around not giving it to your, to your mother and your father. You might could even hang on to it for a little bit longer, just so long as you ultimately gave it to God. That tradition, which, okay, in one way you could say helps them keep one part of the law. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna break my vow, but it was made in a way that breaks God's word. And God, and Jesus' point here is, if you just went back to what God said, if you just went back to the principle of you need to honor your father and your mother, And understand that that has application to their future care, your material blessings, you need to honor them. Then you wouldn't be making these traditions that break His will, His law. The need is always to be biblical. Traditions are always worthy of examination. Again, some traditions, you could say, come from God. They're delivered through His apostles. They're handed down through time. We we aim to keep those. Other traditions we've done because, well, they help us. But you don't have to keep a tradition. Since COVID, I think you could see even in our worship today that some of our traditions have changed. We're having neighborhood devotionals tonight. That's now a tradition here that developed during that time. It seems to help us, and so we're, we're keeping to do those. We don't pass out, right now anyway, we don't pass out the, the emblems, the bread and the fruit of the vine. We, we utilize those in a different way. That's just a matter of a tradition that changed and that may be helping us now. The goal should always be, however, be biblical. And I'm ending there because we're going to talk about something next Sunday of the utmost importance to this congregation. And I want to leave you with that in mind. Don't think of how we have traditionally done something or thought of something. What does the Bible say? How can we be biblical? And we'll talk about that more, Lord willing, next Sunday. But as we conclude this morning, we made the point You know, it can be easy, particularly with how uh, theology has been systematized. You know, we can amplify one part of salvation and maybe disregard another. You'll, of course, remember Jesus giving His disciples the Great Commission. And He tells His disciples in Mark 16 and 16, they need to go into all the world and proclaim the Gospel. And He says to them that, Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Those who do not believe will be condemned. In that passage, there are two aspects, if you will, of your salvation. I would say they are connected, and we could certainly study about that and talk more about that. But depending on which system of theology you ascribe to, one or the other was probably minimized. Your system of theology may have minimized baptism and said, well, it's really not essential. You know, only faith. Your system of theology may talk very little about faith and get right to, well, here's what you need to do. You need to be baptized. Neither system of theology is biblical. Biblical. 
Being biblical is taking what Jesus said at face value. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Then be baptized so that your sins can be washed away because that's exactly what he said to do. If we can aid you in that, won't you come as